This is Report to Wyoming. In this episode, I sit down with the Natrona County District Attorney, Dan Itson. We discuss how he became a DA and some of the things he's seen as a prosecutor and really what makes his job meaningful. My first question is, how does one become a district attorney? You know, I think there has to be a, a, want, and a want and desire to, to get into that field. When I was in third grade, I wrote an essay of what I wanted to do when I grew up. While I didn't use the term district attorney um, or prosecutor, I wanted to help protect people and um, uh, stand up to, to bullies, essentially. Mm. And that's always kind of been the driving principle from that third grade essay forward. I graduated law school at Creighton uh, Law in 2000. I was fortunate enough to get a job with the district attorney's office in, in Natrona County and kind of worked my way through the ranks from there. Yeah, it's fascinating because prosecutors have powers and duties that other attorneys don't have. And one of the, uh, those things that sticks out is um, finding the truth. And justice is a whole nother thing. We'll get to both of those. But truth, um, being a truth seeker, that's an, uh, a unique position you're in. How did, when you were in law school, how did that develop? You know, I, I think when folks are in law school, you, know, you don't know exactly what you want to do when you get out. Um, you have some very general principles that you work on, and then once you're you're practicing, I think they become more refined. Um, seeking the truth obviously is a, an extremely important thing as a prosecutor, and being able to put a case together and present it to a jury in obtain uh, results to help your victims, I think is probably one of the key components of being a prosecutor. Who was your predecessor? Uh, Mike Blonigan was the district attorney before I was. That's right. Okay. And then when did you take over? Uh, I was sworn in January of 18. Before that, were, were you an ADA? I was. I became an ADA in uh, August of 2000, starting with misdemeanors, eventually moving over to the felony uh, unit. God, I don't know, maybe 07, 08, somewhere in that neck of the woods. Has the team of ADAs grown quite a bit in 20 years, or is it about the same? No, um, we have not seen an uh, expansion of prosecutors in over 20 years. Hmm. And, well, what do you think is the, the reason why? Because there's definitely a need. There is. Um, the legislators have given us a slot of so many attorneys, and have never increased that. I've asked the governor in this budget session, or supplemental budget session, to uh, increase that by a couple more prosecutors. Okay, so it's not that you... Okay, so it's not that people don't want the job, it's that you can't hire more. Absolutely, but we're just slotted for uh, 10 positions. Hmm. What was the criminal landscape, if you will, 20 years ago? Um, a lot of methamphetamine, obviously. Um, a lot of domestic violence and, and those type of things, they tend to go hand in hand then uh, property crimes as well. Has that changed? Not really. Um, I think what has changed is the volume of drugs that we see now, um, the severity you know, of, of the property crimes and domestic violences, I think are probably some of the biggest changes you've seen. What about workload? Has it increased, or do you think it's kind of still the same? Our workload, um, I believe, has gone up. Overall, we handle, excluding traffic tickets, north of 3,000 cases a year. Wow. Um, somewhere between, on average, 360 felonies to 400 felonies a year. You know, the biggest things that we've really seen the, the changes in are the weight of drugs that we now see. Um, 20 years ago, maybe you saw an ounce of methamphetamine, and that was a rarity. Mm. And today it's a very common practice to see that, to see pounds of methamphetamine. Right. Um, fentanyl has really taken hold, and to see thousands of uh, fentanyl pills. Yeah, when I got this job two years ago, uh, I was working with a colleague, Tom Morton, I think you know him, um, and... I, I thought every drug bust was newsworthy. I was 
naive. <laughs> and so I thought, oh my gosh, he said, Colby, if it's not over a pound of meth, it's not newsworthy. Yeah. I was like, what? Or a thousand fentanyl pills. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's just a, a tremendous change. Mm. Um, 20 years ago, those were probably what you saw along I-80 corridor um, when drugs were being transported across the nation. But now you're seeing them in central Wyoming. Ugh. I'm sure you've seen a little bit of everything, but uh, when it comes to criminal activity, is there anything that's surprising? You know, we have seen a lot of things. Uh, the uptick in, in youth violence of late it is somewhat shocking. I agree with most of the community that th- those are hard facts to, to deal with because not only are your victims uh, juveniles, but so many times are your offenders. And then what, what, what do you do with those type of cases? And so that's hard to wrestle with, I'm sure. Um, it, it can't just be a nine-to-five job. I feel like there's a definitely, which I wanted to jump to at the end, but the emotional impacts of being a prosecutor. Uh, how did you navigate that in the beginning? You know, they, they do take an impact, uh, not only upon you, but upon your family. Um, mm-hmm. it, it is not a, a nine-to-five job. Uh, most of our prosecutors work at least one day on the weekend. Um, you stay late. Sometimes you come in early. Um, but you, you, you attempt to, to continue to do the things that you like to do in your personal life. And maybe you can't do it to the to the degree that you once did, um, but it, you, you attempt to balance those, those needs, and, and it is tough to to do that at times. So, being responsible is a huge part of being a prosecutor. What other qualities does it take? I think case analysis is probably the most important thing for a prosecutor to have to be able to read a set of facts or an affidavit and have an idea of is this a good case a bad case can we prove this case Um, how do you start presenting that to the jury and I think the prosecutor starts making those decisions the moment he reads a a set of facts and I I think once you make that decision you have to stick with it one way or the other Um, stick with a plan Mm. And oftentimes, if you don't have a plan or you kind of change your plan uh, without good cause, I think that's where prosecutors in general get in trouble. So this plays into trying to decide what you're going to charge an individual with versus what your gut tells you what what really happened, what they could be charged with, but what can you actually charge someone with? Sure. You know, there's that old saying, uh, you know what happened but there's a difference between that and what you can prove. Right. Um, and, 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 and that's true. And you just have to be able to look at witnesses and statements and go, okay, uh, do the facts meet the elements of this charge? And if not, where do we go from there? Is this a, a chargeable case or is it not a chargeable case? Um, oftentimes, prosecutors have to make those decisions fairly quickly. Um, not that they can't ever be revisited, but, um, you know, I think that's where your relationship with law enforcement comes into play. Mm. Um, oftentimes you'll get phone calls in the middle of the night. Hey, here's kind of what's going on. What are your thoughts? And as a prosecutor, you, you give your thoughts, but you're also mulling over things in your head for the rest of the evening and may call back. And there may be a number of phone calls back and forth uh, to help develop that case or or to shepherd that case along. And when you're working with law enforcement, um, are there opportunities for you to suggest uh, things that might help bring a case to justice? You know, we're fortunate here in Natrona County. All law enforcement agencies have a pretty close relationship with each other um, and can sit down and talk about uh, possible issues with the case, uh, possible defenses, those type of things, um, even possible charges, and, and, and discuss the, the pros and cons of charges. 
and then law enforcement can continue their investigation with that knowledge. One thing I want to come back to is that truth part. As a journalist, it can be very difficult trying to find out what happened. I wrote a piece once, and uh, it was about an alleged crime. And one of the parties involved contacted K2 and said, when are you going to print the truth? And I, I thought, nobody knows the truth except you and her. Is it ever difficult trying to decide what happened or if someone is at fault? In some cases, I, th- I think that's accurate. In other cases, I think you have a, a very good idea of exactly what happened. Um, the use of technology in our society right now, um, you would be surprised the number of cameras or recording devices that turn up in investigations. Mm. Um, a lot of folks have different versions of the truth. I think getting back to your question a little bit. And, you know, the one thing that I always try to tell juries in, in a closing is w- look for the small things that connect or make sense. While people may exaggerate or, or be inaccurate about overall events or the big things, rarely do people think about the small things. Mm. And it's, to me, it's always the small things that, that make a difference. How much does rhetoric play into your role? Do you think a lot about how you're going to make a statement? Um, I, I think a lot of prosecutors probably do uh, with respect to, to openings and closings. And um, I think that's part of that preparation. And everybody's a little bit different. You know, mm-hmm. Some people write them down and kind of practice them. Some folks kind of in their head. Um, I, I, I'm somewhere in between those things. I necessarily don't write them down, but I'm always thinking about it and trying to put myself in that role of a juror and say, does this make sense to me? And if not, why not? I've, I've seen some that, as a critic in the, in the peanut gallery, I've seen some the attorneys that maybe overdo it and then... And sometimes they fall a little flat. And so you have to find a good in-between if you're going to make a good argument. Um, And it's not about winning, though. As I said, that I realized that defeats the purpose of your role, which is, again, truth and justice. So I think maybe sometimes people get caught up in this is a contest or I must win. And also even defense attorneys um, and public defenders, they have the burden of trying to prove someone's innocence and it can sometimes get a little bit verbose. I wonder if that, how that affects a jury. Sure. You know, it's hard, I think, to know where that line is. Everybody's a little bit different style-wise. Um, some cases are, are emotional cases, even for a prosecutor. Um, you know, you, you got victims and you have those conversations with somebody's parents. You want to work hard for them. You want to do a good job. And I, I think you're right. At times, things can be a little over the top. There can be things that are kind of dry. Um, and and you got to strike that balance and kind of hopefully know where that is. Sometimes that's hard to do, though. Is it your role to critique ADAs? Um, we do a little bit of that, yes. And, you know, watch different portions of trials, um, talk to them about openings and closings and the aspects of each trial. And, uh, you know, other folks will come and watch, give their, their opinion as well. But, yeah, we try to, to help each other as well. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, one of, I won't name him either, but one of my favorite ADAs to watch always says, passions are high. <laughs> Certain, and it's very true because people do get really passionate when they're talking about their loved ones or something terrible that happened. What is one case that you can talk about that you remember, maybe one of the most memorable cases that you worked from 20 years ago? You know, I did a uh, vehicular homicide a number of years ago with a family coming from Kimmer, Wyoming to Casper um, for an award swimming banquet for their kids. They were hit by an impaired driver 
out at the uh, Pathfinder Ranch. The father of that uh, vehicle died. His mm-hmm. wife and two boys uh, ended up living. They were severely hurt, however. And everything that that family did that day, it was a, an October day. It had snowed. Uh, they delayed their trip to hope to, uh, to get the sun out to clear the snow off the roadways. Um, they stopped to have lunch. And this happens. Um, always kind of struck me is you can be cautious and, and prudent and still things can happen and that quickly you can you know lose your your partner mm-hmm. as far as justice goes now what it what is just in a case like that vehicular on what's the statute say the statute says it's punishable up to 20 years it's you not know, enough yeah my it, opinion but Colby, you gotta understand where we've come from. Those people used to get probation. Yeah. And you know, that wasn't that long ago, and that's not an exaggeration. You know, when you put it in that perspective, and I agree, it's not enough. But we've come leaps and bounds. Um, you know, you're you're routinely looking at a lengthy uh, penitentiary sentence and those things. Um, but you're right, it never puts that family back together. And for years, you know, we would talk on the phone at the anniversary of that uh, case and just see how they're doing. Um, you know, ultimately, the, the, the two boys grew up, went to college and trade schools, got married, um, did those things. So, you know, those memories stick with you for a long time. Something that struck me while you were talking about Um, legislation is how much you must do to try to change uh, the way that criminal cases are well state statutes laws what you can do sure Um, you know Neutrona County is a unique place because even the legislators will call and ask for opinions hey what do you think of this bill what how does this impact the citizens and you can give your two cents and, and talk out about things, um, look at changes that need to be made in certain areas. And I think, you know, th- th- those are all important things. And, you know, we can continue to do that. And I think we have a, a good voice down in Cheyenne to carry that message for us. How do you work through a stack of criminal cases, uh, cases that are on deck waiting to be prosecuted? You know, um, I, I think a, a prosecutor, what we do in our office is we have certain folks that are assigned certain types of crimes. Uh, we have a drug prosecutor that handles probably 90% of the felony drug case load. Hmm. We have a prosecutor assigned to handle adult sexual assault cases. Um, you have a prosecutor who handles major and violent cases. And then, obviously, you kind of have some cases that don't fit those categories, and they kind of get picked up maybe by the the newer felony attorney to kind of handle those. Okay. And there are five or six? Uh, They're including myself, five felony attorneys. Okay. As we enter the colder months, what do you expect to see more of? Is there a change seasonally? You know, there used to be, you would, uh, oh, maybe January, February, have a little bit of lull in, in, in cases. But frankly, that's not, not the case anymore. We, we, we're as busy in the winter months as almost the summer months. Now, something I was reporting on this morning um, is the, the council just talked about the homelessness in Casper. Um, And the coalition is saying that there has been a pretty big uptick in misdemeanor charges. One statement was that people are getting arrested sometimes four times a week. Is that unusual? I I would say with that frequency, yeah, that's probably unusual. Um, City court would probably see those cases on violations of municipal ordinances much more than, than what we would. Okay. But yeah, four times a week is a a lot. 
And it was brought up at the council meeting this week, actually, that all the fines and costs associated with arrests have now cost the courts $900,000. And I believe that's this fiscal year. Um, Something they're hoping to do is uh, apprehend people instead of sending them to jail, trying to send them to treatment. Do you have any thoughts on this? The the treatment question is, it's such a interesting, (laughs) it's almost like an experiment right now. Sure. And you know, Natrona County has always been a leader in that, that regard. We have the Natrona County Drug Court Program, uh, which obviously is treatment-based. And it has uh, a pretty good track record. We've had that for well over a decade. Um, the, the principle of that is uh, to provide treatment, but also to hold folks accountable with immediate sanctions. sanctions excuse me should you uh, screw up your probation. Um, Could have, you explain, sorry to interrupt, sorry. but what's a sanction? A sanction would be if you tested positive for a controlled substance, if you were off curfew, uh, those type of things, things that would violate your terms and conditions of probation. Okay. Um, then we have the, uh, uh, what we call student court, where kids under the age of 18 that are charged as an adult have an opportunity to go into student court, uh, complete that. We've identified them as high risk or high need individuals. Um, we help uh, get them on track in, in high school, uh, complete their, their counseling and their obligations to the justice system. Now, if all those things are done, at the end of that, we'll expunge their record for them. So hopefully they're coming out without a criminal record and a high school diploma. There's a word for this. Is it rehabilitation or the goal of, you know, jail, when someone comes out of jail is that hopefully they're reformed. Right. Right. Is that the word I'm looking for? Uh, Recidivism rate. Recidivism. Yes. Um, Yeah. And, and, you know, I I think with that that program, we're we're doing pretty good. Um, You have to keep in mind we're targeting folks that, are on the edge of dropping out of high school, on the edge of uh, serious criminal trouble to start with. So that success works. Um, we do have a youth diversion program that works much like probation, but there is never a criminal charge formally filed. Mm. And if uh, kids complete that program, then th- there won't be a charge. So, you know, we're trying to get in early and, and redirect people and do that at times through treatment. Um, oftentimes, to, to make troubles worse, it's not only just a question of treatment, but also a question of mental health. Um, and especially when you, you start talking about the homeless population, you kind of have those co-concurring issues going on. And you know, we're, we're, we're trying to address that as well moving forward. Do you, it sounds like efforts are stronger now to target the youth. Maybe target's not the right word either, but have you seen, I guess, more young offenders than you did in past years? You know, I I think we've always kind of tried to help youthful offenders as much as we can. Um, I, I I can't say that you see necessarily an uptick in youthful offenders, but what you do see is the level of violence is clearly up. Mm -hmm. And and that's the thing that has uh, really changed over the the last few years. And this is nothing that you can do as a prosecutor necessarily, but what do you think culturally, like what's changed in Casper? You know, I don't know. to be perfectly perfectly honest, um, I, I think it's a, a combination of, of different factors. And now, a lot of people are armed, and these kids end up with guns one way or the other if they're stolen, if their uh, parents is those type of things. And while years ago, that still may have been the case today. 
people are not afraid to use those firearms. Mm. Something that comes to mind is um, when I was talking to the amazing women who work with the Children's Advocacy Project, uh, also known as CAP, um, we were talking about the number of sex offenders in the area. And one of them brought up, yeah, those are the registered sex offenders. (laughs) And so when I see uh, charges about someone failed to register or a felon with a firearm or these things, Um, It is a really big deal, actually, because those symbolize such a a big portion of people who are getting away with something until they don't need more. And so we've we've got records of, okay, these are the registered sex offenders, for example, but how many are not registered, you know, and... And that's got to be hard to wrestle with as well. When you get a case like that, it's it represents this giant legion of other people who have moved here, maybe because Wyoming is more rural and has more opportunities to work under the table, et cetera. Sure. You know, and when we talk about the CAP Center, that's a another part of this uh, piece of the puzzle that is tremendous. Um, when you talk about the changes over two decades or two and a half decades now, we never had that piece 20 years ago. Wow. It was law enforcement officers trying to interview a six or seven year old child. Hmm. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of trauma there. Oftentimes officers aren't equipped to deal or interview with, with those kids that age. The CAP Center came along um, and, and allows kids to to be interviewed forensically. Uh, the results of that I think are tremendous, but it didn't simply stop there. You know, they provide services for counseling and, and, and growth within the family, which I think is key. And they, they have a large role to play when we, when we talk about sex offense cases. And, uh, they do a tremendous job for this community. That must be one of the hardest parts of your job, I would imagine. I... It, when I read um, affidavits or things involving children, it's hard for me not to talk about it to my partner or my close friends, and they don't want to hear it. They're like, I just, I don't want to hear it. And so then I, I sympathize for law enforcement, people like you who, that's, you know, you want to help people. That's why you got into this job. But day after day, you're seeing the egregious nature of humans um and that's that's a beat down so we can't end it on that note right <laughs> what is in the last few minutes the best part of your job you know i i did a murder case a number of years ago and it was an extremely tough murder case and we had some very frank discussions with the family that we weren't sure how the case would turn out um we knew what had happened we knew their son was dead we knew why, we're just not sure what the jury would do with that set of facts. The jury convicted uh, the defendant and after the the jury had come back we were in a conference room with the family and his dad came up and gave everybody a hug and just said thank you Mm. and said you know I'm happy to know my son wasn't responsible for his own death. That's why you do this job. This has been Report to Wyoming, presented in the public interest by Town Square Media.